church. Good morning, church. Somebody just lift those hands and give God praise. Let us rise and just worship God. For there is none like unto Him. Just, just lift up those hands and just say, Lord, just thank Him. For He is God. It's not my power, it's not my might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He is the reason that we are here this morning. Father, we just give you praise, we honor you. We worship you, we give you all the glory. You are God, besides you there is no other. Oh Lord, we just say thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. We bless your name, we give you praise. Oh God. For you are great. For you are great, for you are great, hallelujah.
mightier than the mightiest. Hey, who can match your strength? You are great. You are great. You are great. You are great. Just leave us and give God the praise. Hallelujah, Lord, we worship you. You are worthy to be praised.
And the doctor said to me, several years ago, he said, Paul, I think you have cancer. But my God is great. Paul, I'm going to be with you. It doesn't matter what you're going through. And the same doctor came and called me and said, Paul, you don't have cancer no more. Somebody say, Greg. Praise. Somebody just give God praise. His wordy, his wordy. There's none like him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we just give you praise. We give you thanks for you are, you are here in this place. Your word makes us understand that when two or three are gathered together in your name, you are there in your midst. Lord, we're not going to let the rocks cry out in our place. God, we are going to stand. We are going to stand and we're going to praise you. Father, Lord, we are going to praise you. It doesn't matter the circumstances that we are going through. It doesn't matter the situation that we are facing. God, we are going to stand. Hallelujah. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in my long. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in my love. So we pour out our praise to you, oh, oh, great are you, Lord, help me sing.
our father's house this is where we belong right it's good to see your beautiful faces praising God knowing that all the earth will shout because when he comes you know every tongue and every knee will bow down because he's the only God and we are actually waiting for his coming Jesus Christ and we are saying you know all the earth every tongue will confess that he is Christ and he is the Lord. And uh, it's good to have you all back worshiping him. And uh, I urge you, church, I urge you in the name of Jesus Christ that our worship, let's do it in spirit. Because that's where the hidden things are revealed. Stop looking at another people, another person next to you. Focus on Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life for you. The one who died on the cross. So we can have this access to the Father. The unapproachable light that was brought down by Jesus. So we can have access to the Father. No one has ever seen God. Only Jesus Christ who came with this light. And now darkness has to flee. Because the light is here. You are the light of the earth. And yet let your light shine. Um... For those who are also on uh, TV, YouTube, we welcome you. This is the Sunday that God has given us. And we will worship him with every breath that we have in our lungs. So uh, if you are here and you are a visitor, we encourage you. We do have the green cards in front of the pew. You can pick up, we can fill one, bring it to the ashes. And if you are interested in this church, we love people. And our prayer is God bring them in. Bring them in before it's too late. Because how many of you know that the ark will be closed, the door will be closed. And once it's closed, Sister Pat, it won't, it won't help. So it's the time now. So bring them in. And when you come in, feel free to speak with anyone. 
And then, you know, if you're interested in this church, please take it a step further. And God will do mighty things in your life. So you can do that. And each transfer uh, is also available right there uh, outside in the foyer if you want to give your tithes and offerings in that way. It's easy. It's quick. And uh, there's also our offering basket right here. You can come and bring your savings, uh, your, your, your offerings even during the, the, the service here. Uh, feel free to do that. And all will go toward building and maintaining this facility God has given us. And also the work that is being done in this church. We appreciate it. When God, because he doesn't run out of resources. He will always have you replaced if you don't come to church. And I don't want my seat to be taken by somebody. I want to be here when Jesus Christ comes. And then we will see him in glory. So please, let's do it while we have time. And also, uh, this Tuesday, we are going to have something unusual. Normally, we do meet separately, men and women. But God has laid it. To say that it's time for us Just one time, not all the time Just this Tuesday All our men Of Wilma Heights Kuma And us Sashi Will be meeting together on Tuesday Because the reason for this is to know What a kingdom man and a kingdom woman Looks like Who is a kingdom woman and a kingdom man So that's the, what God has given us to lay on our hearts to study and to prepare us for our father's kingdom. So let's meet at seven. It's going to be just one hour and then we can now just see how it works. Not that we are planning to have a combined, who knows, but we always meet separately. But this Tuesday we are going to be together, right? Seven o'clock here at the church. Please, let's be here. Our women are doing a good job. You know, this Tuesday we are taking uh, our summer break and this Tuesday we started, and we had like 15. We even had three on the uh, online there, and some were present here. It's beautiful to see what God is doing in our lives, you know, transforming us to be the kingdom woman He has prepared, you know, before we're even born. And uh, also this Wednesday, this Wednesday, we have our business meeting here at the church. And uh, this will be September the 20th at 7.15. So you can actually pick up a copy of the agenda and the financial statement in the lobby. Uh, a copy of the spring business meeting is also posted there in the, uh, on the board by the stairs if you want to review that. Uh, and uh, now say this Thursday. This Thursday has come because we've been saying about our seniors going to Niagara Falls. Now it's this Thursday. So all our seniors, all our seniors, they will be meeting here this Thursday, September the 21st. Uh, and I know, you know, the cost is $20. Sister Rookie and Brother Terry are the ones, you know, who are leading all this. So if it's something that you want to do, I think there's still time to purchase your tickets, right? Yes, Sashi's, uh, Sister Ruki is nodding her head. She's saying it is. And also, um, we are planning, Pastor is planning our parent and child dedication service, uh, which is um, on Thanksgiving Sunday, which is October the 8th. It's already Thanksgiving, my goodness. Uh, this would be here at church at 9 a.m. here at Wilma. So if you are interested in participating in this ceremony, please contact the church office. And the number is 416-757-5266. Or you can actually email the, uh, the child's name and uh, the date of their birth and the parent's name. And so that uh, we will take a good record of that. Uh, Sister Sarah has got an announcement. I'm going to call Sister Sarah to come and give us the announcement. Amen.
thought I was on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm one person who really loves to praise the Lord through song. I do. And I'm also encouraging you the same, to love to praise the Lord through song. You don't have to have a gift that you can sing those vocals, those whatever you may think or you may call them. But let's all have a desire to praise the Lord, to always keep our praises lifted up. So on September 30th, on Saturday, September 30th, at 7 p.m., right here, we have Lift Up Praise. It's a night of worship, an evening of worship. We come here, praise the Lord through song. We have uh, those ministers who will be leading us into the presence of the Lord through song. And we also have our worship team. So please, I would like to encourage each one of you to plan, put it on your calendar. Saturday, 7 p.m., September 30th. That is the last Saturday of this month. And if you're coming from work, we will have refreshments at the end of the event. So don't say that you're so tired, you want to go eat. Please come here. Let us give thanks to God. There are so many things that he has done for us and to all of us. And we lift up our praises and to the Lord. And this will also usher us to the conference that we have in October so that we come prepared even as we draw the members of the community. Lift up praise is also an outreach. An outreach. There are many moments that we've had this event and people who are sick, they get healed. People who don't have a relationship with Christ, they give their lives to Christ. So please, I'm encouraging you to come, bring your family and friends. God bless you. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Let's move on to our vision prayer focus. This is our outreach prayer. We are praying. And I always ask you, let's pray together. That the Lord will raise up new generations of missionaries. From Wilma to share God's word beyond East Toronto. We thank God for what he's currently doing right now. But there's work out there. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we glorify your name this morning. We give you all the praise and all the honor because it belongs to you, Father. Thank you, God, for creating us, for putting us on this earth to worship you. That's why you created us, God. Everything else is a bonus. Our primary is to worship you, God. With every breath that we have as we were singing, Every breath that you have given us, God, we thank you for giving us this Sunday to come into this house with hearts full of thanksgiving and praising you, God, because there is no one like you. And we are praying, God, this hour that in this church, God, there is work to do outside. And we are praying for people whom you are touching their hearts tonight or this morning that they will take this word outside and become the missionaries. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be a missionary in your, in your own home, in your own surrounding. You don't have to even leave your country because they are lost souls out there, God. So we are saying, may you touch our hearts so we know this responsibility is ours. And if there are ones you want to send even outside Canada, we pray, God, that you might even raise some from our church here. Raise them up, God, to take this word seriously before Jesus Christ comes. Thank you, Jesus. And we pray, Father, that you will bless us here as we expand because that's what you created us for, to multiply when we hear this word. And we thank you, God, even for the word that is about to come. We thank you for our, our praise. We thank you for being in our midst. And we thank you for the word you have for us today. May it knock us all to understand what time it is. We lift up even the preacher God. You have given him the word. Help us to receive it. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
shall we rise, please? It's great to be in the house of the Lord.
Christ is my firm foundation. And it won't start now I've never seen the righteous forsaken And it won't start now We are 
say, and I say with you. ahead and just give God praise. Just, just give God praise. Give word. The songwriter says, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, how I prove you, or and or. Praise him. I don't know if you could just help me sing that. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust you more. Come on, lift it up if you know it. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. How? How I trust you, how I prove you more and more. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Precious Jesus. All for grace. All for grace to trust more. Come on, say Jesus. Somebody say his name. Precious Jesus. Oh, for grace. Jesus, Jesus. How I trust you. Jesus. Oh, for grace. One more time. Somebody say his name. Sound beautiful choir, how let's sing together. I trust how I prove him. Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him.
come on just lift up a sound of praise unto the Lord he is our firm foundation he is the rock on which we stand when everything around us is shaking when it seems that everything around us is sinking he is our anchor he is our hiding place and Lord we pray for grace that even in the midst of what we see that in the midst of what we feel that in the midst of what we hear God give us the grace to trust you more give us the grace to trust you more God that every other name would fade away Lord God that we would cling to the name of Jesus that we would cling to the power that is in that name that we might trust you more and become the disciples that you've called us to be in this hour we glorify you we magnify you we yield to you in this moment and we stand in expectation of what it is that you will do so we say have your way today be glorified today be magnified today and give us the grace to trust you more in Jesus name come on somebody and lift up a praise to our God come on we can do a little bit better than that put your hands together lift up a sound of praise he's been better than good to me he's been better than good to me he's been better than good to me hallelujah hallelujah so many doors he's opened so many ways he's made but is anybody grateful simply for the gift of salvation life now is sweet and my joy is complete for I'm saved I'm saved I'm saved is anybody grateful for the gift of salvation let me behave myself let me behave myself but the songwriter says when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me my soul cries out hallelujah thank God for saving me he's a good good father hallelujah 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 I'm just grateful I'm grateful that he chose me is anybody grateful he could have chosen anybody else but he saw past your mess past your inadequacies and he said my son my daughter I'm calling you anyways I'm calling you to arise from the pit that that devil thought you were gonna die in I'm calling you with purpose I'm calling you to restore you because there's a work for you to do in the earth is anybody grateful let's just lift up a thank you Jesus one more time thank you Jesus it's a privilege and an honor to serve him to be loved by him to be known by him and to have relationship with him he's not just the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob he's not just the God of yesterday but he is mine my God my God hallelujah we thank God for his goodness today and let's take a moment while we're standing and celebrate the angels of this house Dr. Ty and Lady Marion Adebaboye we thank God for you for your perpetually your consistent service in the kingdom of God we are grateful we are grateful and we thank God for you and for the worship team for the musicians for the AV team for the deacons the elders everyone serving and for each of you the people of God come on put your hands together put your hands together look over at the person beside you and just say it's good to see you in the house today it's good to see you in the house today look over at the other person on your other side and just say neighbor it's good to see you in the house today hallelujah before you're seated as we're standing I'd invite you to turn with me to the book of Matthew I'm gonna be in Matthew chapter 13 
verses 24 to 30. I'll be reading from the King James Version, but feel free to follow along in whatever translation it is that you have. And the word of the Lord reads, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go up and gather them up? But he said, Nay. Lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in the bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Let's bow our heads one more time. Father, we come before you, counting ourselves privileged and honored to be able to receive your word once more. God, we pray that if there be anything that would hinder us from receiving the word that you are releasing today, God, that you would remove it now in the name of Jesus. Father God, that you would allow us to be sensitive, to be perceptive and aware of what it is that you're doing in this moment. We pray, God, that you would have your way pray that you would anoint my lips, Lord God, to speak your word with clarity and with power. I decrease in this moment that you might rise up in me, that you might increase through me, and that you might have your way in the lives of your people. We say, Lord, whatever you want to do, do it, Lord. We yield, we surrender, and we say yes. We thank you, Lord God, for calling us for such a time as this. And we pray that in spite of what it is that we see, in spite of the time in which we're living, that we would not lose heart, that we would not faint, but that we would continue to believe in you and on you, trusting and believing that you will continue to have your way. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. In the year 1999, on the dawn of a new millennium, the dawn of the 21st century, Quebec-based photographer Francois Brunel began a project entitled, I'm Not a Look-Alike. Somebody say, I'm not a look-alike. And Brunel began this project with the purpose of connecting and photographing people around the world, born to different parents, and in some cases from different cities, different countries, who look almost identically alike. It's one thing to endeavor to photograph twins, but Brunel set out to capture unrelated people who shared glaring similarities to the degree that if others were to have seen them together walking down the street, they would believe them to be twins. It's interesting that within recruiting and photographing these couples, as Brunel would call them, or doppelgangers, as others would say, there is always something that will eventually give away who is who. This is not evidenced at the first glance, but over time with the two, it becomes clearer who is who. They, they look similar. In some instances, they have similar stories or interests, yet there is always something distinctly different about these almost identical individuals. They are differently similar. And for our time together this morning, 
As God's spirit show, God, I want to speak to you from that thought, if that's all right. Somebody shout it back to me. Differently similar. Differently similar. I think it's safe to say that we're living in a day and a time where things are radically changing before our eyes. Do I have a witness here? As people called to be in the world but not of the world, we are living in a time where the lines are becoming increasingly blurred. And things are seeming to become more and more unclear. We can live in the same neighborhood, be of the same cultural makeup, work for the same company. Some of us worship at the same church. Yet, at the same time, though we might look like we're in sync, the closer you examine the connection, you realize that in some cases there's no alignment. And it's strange because for many of us, it took a situation, it took a disagreement, or perhaps it just took time to reveal that who you thought was with you may not have actually been all the way with you. That who you thought was for you and for what you were about might not have actually been for you or for what you're about. Some of the ones that you thought were radically on fire for Christ, they might have had a genuine zeal but not a zeal that was according to knowledge, a zeal that was devoid of relationship, true relationship with Christ. And it can be scary because it seems at times as though things are imploding before our eyes. Do I have a witness? Things are imploding before our eyes. And what do you do? What do you do when the one who led you to Christ the one who led you to Christ claims to no longer believe in him. I don't know if you've been following the trends that we've been seeing over the last decade or so, but there's been an increasing amount of prominent Christian figures, Christian influencers, in some cases pastors, worship leaders, some of who I've gleaned from, howbeit from a distance as I don't know them personally, but their ministries have impacted my life in some way, shape, or form that once seemed to have stood firmly in their position in Christ, yet have now not only left their post, but have broken away from their relationship with him entirely. Though the similarities were undeniable, over time the differences that have come to the surface have been in some cases life-altering. Just wave your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Think it not strange that the Apostle Paul, he says these words in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 to 3. He says to the church at Thessalonica, he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit or by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you, watch this, by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Contextually speaking, Paul is speaking to the Thessalonians and letting them know that before the return of Christ, there will be a falling away, and the son of perdition will be revealed. So I'm going to circle back to this passage. I want you to hold your finger there. But it is notably an unusual time that we are living in. We're living in a time where we're seeing a great falling away. Seeing many more emboldened in their stance, not for but against Christ. And though it is an unusual time. Though it is a time of revealing, though it is safe to say that the coming of our Lord is near, the text encourages believers not to be shaken because a falling away will precede the day of Jesus Christ. So in other words, what we are watching unfold is expected to happen. The group, the group New Edition, they coined this song, Can You Stand? Can You Stand the Rain? But my question to you today is, can you outstand the fall? Can godly growth spring forth amidst a great falling away? 
Our text that finds us in the 13th chapter of Matthew. Matthew desiring within his gospel to clarify and make plain to a Jewish audience the correlation and the connection between the prophecies of old and their fulfillment in Jesus. Jesus in our text is now sharing with a large crowd and this is his second parable within this interaction. He has just finished telling them of the parable of the sower and the seed. And he is now shifting gears slightly though similarly in discussing the parable of the wheat and the tares or in some translations the wheat and the weeds. In the previous parable what, what Jesus discussed was four types of grounds that seeds are sown into parallel, paralleling the grounds of which the kingdom, of which the, the, the gospel is preached. The message of the kingdom is preached. So he says that some fell on the path and were snatched up and eaten by birds. That's the first type of seed. Then, then, then he says that the others fell into rocky places with limited soil, growing quickly due to shallow soil. It's kind of interesting how with shallow roots, sometimes there can still be quick growth. But the withering and falling away came shortly thereafter. There are others that fell amongst thorns, and as they began to grow up with the thorns, they were choked away. And finally, there were those that fell into good soil, which remained to produce fruitful crops. So our text now, it begins with a new parable, though similar. It is one of the eight kingdom parables found in the 13th chapter of Matthew. Jesus, through this passage, he speaks to an audience of those desirous to know whether or not the kingdom of heaven had come yet. And if so, if the kingdom has come, why is evil continuing to persist? He speaks to an audience consisting of disciples, consisting of those who were intrigued, and likely, I believe, of those who might have also been to some degree religious fanatics, those who in their desire to see the world rid of evil, their world rid of evil, would at times even run the risk of harming other believers as they sought to deal with and excommunicate those whom they believed to be a threat to the advancing of the gospel. And it's on this backdrop with these questions in mind that Jesus speaks this parable to the crowd. Jesus, he would often speak in parables, but very rarely would he go on to provide the interpretation of the parable that he was speaking to. But in this case, in this scenario, he spoke the parable and later on in the chapter, verses 36 to 43, you find him interpret the parable that he speaks to. But for the sake of time, we're just going to deal with verses 24 to 30, if that's all right with you today. So, so in contrast to the previous parable that ended with seed falling in good ground, Jesus shares that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, which leads us to this key that I think we can extract from the text. Somebody say, Jesus plants intentionally. Come on, say it one more time. Jesus plants intentionally. So without reaching too far into Jesus' interpretation of this passage, he expresses that the one sowing the seed is the Son of Man. He himself, Jesus the Christ, and the field in which he sows is the world. The text says that the man, or in other words, Jesus not only plants seed in soil, but he plants good seed in his soil. So in other words, what Jesus plants, people of God, what Jesus plants is good. What Jesus calls good is good. And hear me, at times the facts that we know about ourselves, uh, the, the, the limitations that we are aware of, the inadequacies that we have or believe ourselves to have, the reasons which would undoubtedly cause us to question whether or not we're qualified, these factors cause us to think. That though we've been planted where we are, where God has us, we're not good enough. But you've heard me say it before, our goodness in Christ is not based on our merit. It is not based on our works. It is not based by things that we've done, but based on the goodness of Jesus. And he called us good before we ever displayed fruitfulness or before others could identify who or what we are or who or what we're becoming. So somebody ought to be encouraged in that, that we are good seed of Christ 
in Christ, not planted in any garden, but we are planted in his garden. Is anybody grateful that he planted you, that he positioned you, that he called you to be where you are for such a time as this? Within this parable, the garden belonged to the sower, and in like manner, in borrowing from the words of the psalmist in Psalm 24 and 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. The seed was handpicked by the master, deemed good by the master, and planted by him in his field, which would undoubtedly also be good. So nevertheless, the text the text, somebody say, the text is not present without tension. <laughs> the text is not present without a little bit of tension. The Bible says that at night, when everyone was sleeping, the enemy came. The enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat and went away. But the tares or the weeds did not become apparent in the moment that the enemy planted them. <laughs> the tares or the weeds did not become apparent to the servants or the gardens until the text says that the heads of the blade or the wheat began to sprout. It's interesting to me that clarity begins to become more apparent as the wheat begins to grow out. Somebody will get that one in a minute. One of the questions that I had as I was wrestling with this text, as I was reading this passage, Dr. Ty, is how does one plant tares? How do you plant weeds? Because I'm not like, I don't have extensive knowledge in gardening, but from what I understand, from what I know, I've always known weeds to be unwanted plants that appear in undesirable places. They show up in the most random places at random times, like, are they planted? Do they just grow out of nowhere? So as I was studying this passage, I realized that the weeds or the tares that the text is speaking to, it's a specific kind of tear. They derive from the Greek word zizanion, which is a plant called darnel. Somebody say darnel. I know that sounds like somebody's name, but darnel. <laughs> don't, don't miss this. Darnel is a plant that looks exactly like wheat. It looks exactly like wheat, but its effects are much different. Wheat is life-giving. Wheat is used for bread. Wheat is nutritious. While the Darnell plant, though resembling wheat in its early stages, is a plant that can adversely affect your mind, adversely affect your body, sometimes even causing immobilization, paralyzes you. Wheat and Darnell look similar in the early stages, but they are very different. And the differences become apparent as things begin to grow out. Somebody say out. Because it's one thing to grow up. It's another thing to grow out. We may grow up in the same neighborhood, but what grows out of us is different. Some of us may grow up in the same church. But what grows out of us is different. To be connected to Christ, it doesn't speak merely to growing up in height or in stature, growing in name, growing in being loved or admired, or even growing in your image. But it speaks to what grows out of you. Because you might start off looking the same. We might start off looking the same before what's in us starts to grow out. But it's more than looking the part. It's more than sounding the part. It's more than dressing the part. But if we claim to be committed to following Jesus, if we claim to be followers of Christ, it's more than simply being able to have people say, oh, that, that person says they're Christian. That person goes to church. But it is a matter of what grows out of us. What grows out of us. Because what comes out will reveal what's within what comes out will reveal who is within. What comes out, dare I say, will reveal who you're rooted in. So it matters not simply to grow up, but it matters what grows, what grows out, what grows out. And I'm not going to mess with this right here, but the counterfeit and the real thing, <laughs> they look 
identical until you get close enough to discern between the two or until you give enough time for what's inside of the seed to begin to grow out. The text says that as the servants saw the wheat beginning to spring up, the tares appeared. And upon discovering the tares, the servants consulted the owner. They, they, they consulted the owner of the garden, and they said, didn't you sow good, good seed? Didn't you plant good seed in this garden? To which he responds, an enemy did this. An enemy did this. The enemy, Jesus later clarifies, to be Satan attempting to destroy the Lord's kingdom, attempting to offset the work that God is doing, attempting to buffet, to stifle, and to suck out the life and the power of the believers. The servant's response, the servants say, shall we go up and pluck out the tares? And I, I think that the response of the servants it's reflective of the response that many of us have when we see things that seem to be out of order. It's the response that I believe also many of the zealots in Jesus' day had. Shall we go and pluck them up, pull them up, to which he said no. Per adventure, you uproot and destroy the wheat as well. He says, let them grow until the harvest. Somebody say, harvest time is coming. Let them grow until the harvest, which leads us to the second key in the text. Somebody say, Jesus empowers undeniably. Jesus empowers undeniably. The master in our text, symbolic of Jesus, is aware of what the enemy has planted within his garden. He's aware of what has been done, aware of what is occurring within the church. And it becomes identifiable to the disciples. Their gut reaction, like many of our own, is to rush to get rid of those whom we do not believe to be genuine followers of Christ. Because the assumption is that the tares or the evil, disingenuous, carnal, pretending people that we identify within the church will compromise the growth of those of us who are striving to grow in the knowledge of God, the, the health of those of us who are striving to live for Jesus for real. But the master doesn't see it this way. The, the, the master, his concern is that the premature pulling up of the wheat, of the, of the weeds rather, will cause damage to the wheat, more damage to the wheat than allowing them to grow in the midst, in the midst of the tares. As one scholar says, to the farmer, it was more important to save the good wheat than to get rid of the weeds or the tares. And I believe that this sentiment is shared because Jesus empowers us to grow in the midst of evil. Somebody say, Jesus empowers us to grow in the midst of evil. I know that we're living in a time where good is called evil and evil is called good. I know we're living in a time where it seems that men have become lovers of themselves, where it seems that people who stood for the Lord are turning from him. But Jesus empowers us to grow in the midst of evil. Somebody say, stay rooted in him. Stay rooted in him. If I had time, I would share with you that I think, this is my belief, I think that ease may at times be a greater threat to genuine faith than evil. Ease may be a greater threat to genuine faith than evil. I tell you about the fact that if you look into the growth of the church beyond North America, one of the fastest growing churches in the world is actually the church in Iran. And it is growing exponentially, watch this though, without its own property, without its own building or central leadership. Lives are threatened to be killed on a daily basis by their neighbors who oppose them on the basis of their faith. Yet Iranian Christians, though they are in the presence of people who look like them, speak the same language as them, perhaps live in the same neighborhood as them, but diametrically oppose their Christian faith belief in Jesus Christ as they cling to Jesus, as they stay rooted in Jesus, as they hold on to Jesus, 
exponential growth and a radical transformation continues to occur, making it the fastest growing church in the world. And one underground pastor, he put it like this. He said, converts run when the fire comes. Disciples don't. And my question to you today, church, is how are you going to handle the fire? Because the fire is going to come regardless. But are you going to allow it to cause you to back up and recoil? Or are you going to allow God to use it to refine you? Are you going to allow God to use it to purify you? Are you going to allow God to use it to go forward in the gospel? Because the fire is coming, dare I say, for many of us. Some of you might be going through some fire in your life right now. We're family members that know what it is that you stand for, that used to stand with you. They are attacking you because of your faith in Jesus. Where it seems like all hell is breaking loose at the job. Where it seems like those who used to stand firmly and boldly for what it is that you stand for no longer stand with you. How are you going to handle the fire? How are you going to handle the fire? Somebody say, I will stand firmly rooted in Jesus. And by the grace of God, I'm going to grow in the midst of this. I'm going to grow through this. Growing in Christ. Growing to become a disciple. Because it's not enough to say yes to the Lord without saying yes to the process of discipleship. The process of being sanctified to be made more like him. Because the fire will expose the depth of your roots. The fire will expose whether or not you simply said yes, Lord, or you're living it out on a day-to-day -day basis. But we will not be shaken. We will not bow down. We will not let go. We will not stop growing. But we will remain confident in this, that we will see the goodness of the Lord. We will stand and see the salvation of our God. And we will grow in the midst of evil. As believers, the opposition to the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and his cause, it does not simply cause us to meet opposition outside of the church, but also within it. The enemy is not just wreaking havoc at school, not just wreaking havoc at the job, not just wreaking havoc on the outside, but inside the church as well. Temptation isn't just springing up outside the church, but also within it. And a falling away and the attempt to exalt our flesh over God's spirit. Our preferences over the conviction of the Holy Spirit is not just happening outside the church but it's happening inside of the church as well. And though it's disheartening to admit, tears do grow amongst wheat. And this could be sad news, people of God, if you allow it to be. But I believe that this also invites us and allows us to be careful, to be vigilant, and to be Christ-centered, Christocentric in the way that we approach life, in the way that we approach the times that we are living in. Because though the similarities might be evident, the differences, they become clearer as we grow. And Jesus, he empowers us. He equips us. And he enables us to grow even in the face and in the midst of the evil that we see in our day and in our time. His power, it is not compromised due to the attack of the enemy. It's not compromised due to the threats of the kingdom of darkness. Though we may not see how we can grow in light of wars and rumors of wars, though we might not see how we can grow in light of a global mental health crisis, in light of natural disasters, in light of evil being called good and good being called evil, in light of people's situations and issues that we face on a daily basis, though they might give us every reason to shrink, Jesus empowers us to keep 
growing, to keep going, to stay rooted, to stay grounded, to stay in his word, to continue to seek his face, to continue to call on his name, to continue to fast and pray and grow in the midst of this. The growth is not of our own volition. The strength is not of our own power, but God at work through Christ who works in us to do and to, to will and do of his good pleasure to grow well. It is him that is working in us. That there is no hour, no season, no time that we find ourselves in that he is not present. He said in his word, lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of time. So until you breathe your last breath, until Jesus returns to take us home, he remains with us. He remains the same. Somebody say it one more time. Grow through it. Grow through it. Not only does Jesus plant intentionally, not only does Jesus empower undeniably, but catch this. Jesus assesses carefully. Somebody say carefully. Yeah. Hear me. Our haste at times is to do a work that we have not been authorized to do. That we are not fully equipped to do. We may identify what we believe to be tears. But often, if we're not careful, our zeal and haste can actually discourage those who are also genuinely yearning for Christ. Hear me. In assessing carefully, Jesus will be the one who authorizes the harvesters. His angels to pull the tares on the day of the harvest and judgment. Jesus waits until the end to allow both the tares and the wheat, those totally surrendered and submitted to him, and those who simply act like they are, but have not truly surrendered their hearts and their lives to him, to grow fully until the day of harvest. That the evidence of our hearts, the evidence of our lives, the evidence of our commitment, of the posturing of our hearts, it will become made known as to whether or not we were truly in his kingdom or whether or not we were tares or those whom embraced and allowed the influence of tares to cause us to embrace something other than what Jesus told us to. The servants desire to pull the weeds out, but that is the work of the harvester. And likewise, as we, as, as we are followers of Jesus, as we are followers of Christ, though we may at times desire to do the work of plucking things out, of pulling people away, of ostracizing and demonizing those whom we believe to be tares, we are not skilled in or authorized to dividing the redeemed from the unredeemed in the way that Christ is because the job of the harvester is to do that. And as I was thinking through this passage, as I was thinking through this passage, my mind, it ran to the subject of gardening. I don't have a lot of experience in it, but I would watch my grandparents every now and again as they would garden. And it occurred to me that oftentimes our inclination in plucking out weeds or what we believe to be weeds, can also be to pluck out or to pull up what we believe to be unproductive plants or wheat. But could it be that some genuine believers, ourselves included, may still be in the process of sprouting? Though others may have sprouted their heads before, though others may have grown at a faster or a more rapid rate, started bearing fruit more quickly, could it be that some of what we're calling weeds, 
or are calling unproductive wheat. God is actually still doing something in their heart too. To my recollection, not every tree, not every plant grows at the same time, grows at the same speed, grows to the same extent. But as I would watch my grandparents nurture the trees in their garden, the plants in their garden, caring for each one of them, eventually even the late bloomers began to sprout and the evidence spoke for itself over time by what grew out of them. I heard this story once. It was actually a story my grandparents told me. I didn't see it, but I heard it. A few years ago as they were planting, they looked in the garden and they noticed something growing unusually. Something that was growing abnormally. They, they weren't sure what it was or why it was growing in the way that it was. Thinking it was just a random shrub growing in the midst of their garden. But they allowed it to grow until harvest time. And as harvest time came and as they were weeding out their garden and began to pull it up to their surprise and amazement, this unusual looking thing that was growing in their garden on the other side of this shrub it was actually potatoes in the ground were big healthy luscious potatoes if they would have plucked it prematurely they would have missed the revelation that sometimes things have to grow down before they can grow out Sometimes things have to grow down before they can grow up. Sometimes things have to grow in a rooted place before you can see what's happening on the inside. In fact, when we look at the tip of the iceberg, we know that that's only a small fraction of what's happening below and beneath the surface. So I want to talk to a late bloomer today that maybe you're discouraged because you're saying, I don't even, I don't know if God has his hand on me. I don't know where I stand with him. I love him. I'm studying my word, I'm praying. I want more of him. But when I pray, it doesn't sound like how the elder that I admire prays. That when I play the instrument, though I believe God has anointed me to play, I don't play in the same way that my brother plays. I can't preach like the way that Dr. Ty preaches. I may not have the words to evangelize like the evangelists evangelize. Stay where God has you. Continue to seek his face. Because God might be doing a work beneath the surface that has not been made apparent yet. But as you allow him to continue to work on you until the day of the harvest, what is happening on the inside, it will show. It will come to the surface. And to those of us who have a zeal and a desire to be the kingdom enforcers, there's nothing wrong with being kingdom ambassadors, but be careful trying to do the work of the harvester because sometimes in our haste and in our zeal we might actually be interfering with and interrupting a work that God is doing in wheat that we think are weeds somebody say let God have his way let God have his way he sees he knows and he will authorize the plucking and carefully assess and determine in the end who is and who is not of his fold. As sharp as our vision may be, his vision is better. His judgment is true. And his grace, it is both extensive and empowering. If we're honest in this place, some of us who know we are weak today can say there was a season in my life where I didn't look how I look now. There was a season in my life where I didn't preach or pray like I pray now. 
there was a season in my life where the fruit was not as evident as it, as it is now. But God took his time with me. He was patient with me. He waited on me. He extended grace and mercy. And though people discounted me on the basis of my past, what God was doing beneath the surface, it's evident now. Is that anybody's testimony to now? To, 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 is that anybody's testimony today? I am the evidence of what the grace of God can do. I'm a living testimony that God restores. He empowers us to grow in the midst of evil. And eventually he will show who is and who is not in his kingdom. Time will make plain the differences between those whom we are uncertain whether or not they stand with Christ or whether or not they simply appear to be. But let the Lord do his job. He plants intentionally. He empowers undeniably. And he assesses carefully. Our job is to preach the gospel. Our job is to love with the love of Christ. Our job is to ensure that we are nurturing and stewarding well what God has given us, where God has us. That he might do the job that only he can do. He will add and multiply. He will subtract and divide as he sees fit in the final judgment. And those of us who truly are his will be united with him apart from evil and welcomed into eternity with him forever. He will handle the weeds. He will handle the weeds. But until then, let us grow intentionally. Let us stay rooted in him undeniably and unapologetically. And let us become the people of God that he is calling us to be in this hour. Before I close, if I could go back to what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians. Further in the chapter, 2 Thessalonians 2. He says in verses 13 to 17. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth, whereunto he called you by the gospel, by our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch it. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the teaching. Hold to the tradition. Hold to what you've been taught, whether by word or epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which has loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace watch this comfort you comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work so in other words the prayer that Paul prays and the prayer that I'm praying today is may the Lord God comfort you and establish you in every good word and work to grow in the midst of evil. We will not panic. We will not be shaken. We will not be removed from our post. We will not back up. We will not back down. We will not go back, but we will stand firmly and grow unapologetically in him. Somebody look over at the person beside you one more time and just say, stay rooted, stay rooted. Stay rooted in the Lord. Continue in him, continue for him. The, the scripture says, for in him we live, we move, and we have our being. Though our world is changing, though we're living in a time where many are becoming more overt and explicit, in the way that they denounce Jesus, in the way that they stand against him. In a world where many people are trying 
to find similar ways to stand together at the expense of submitting to the Lordship of Christ. My prayer is, Lord, keep me different. We may look the same. We may come from the same place. We may work together. We may study together. But, Lord, keep me different. I don't want the influence of weeds to cause me to forget that even though we grow together, there's something different in me. There's something different in us. There's something different in us because as followers of Jesus, Jesus who died the death that we deserved, raised to life, empowering us, us with his resurrection power, 50 days later he sent his Holy Spirit not just to cause us to look different, but to dwell inside of us and to give us power to be his witnesses in the earth. There's something on the inside of you as a believer in Jesus. That though you may look similar in certain ways, though you may live amongst the world, God has called us to be the light in the world, the light of the world, the light to the world. Somebody say it one more time, Lord, keep me different. Let us grow through what it is that we find ourselves in. Let us stay rooted in the Lord Jesus and allow him to have his perfect work in and through our lives. He plants intentionally. He empowers undeniably and he assesses carefully that at the end of the day, we can stand and be differently similar. Let us rise to our feet in the name of Jesus. And before I pass it over to Dr. Ty, I want to make an appeal. Because although this word was more of an encouragement to the believer, I think it's also an encouragement to someone who questions where it is that you stand. Maybe you're saying, I am serving, seeking the face of Jesus. I'm striving to grow. I just don't see the fruit to the extent that I'd like to see it yet. But maybe for some of you, you're saying, I'm not living how I should be living. I've heard the message. I know who Jesus is. I know the times that we're living in. I know the proclivity that I have to be influenced by the tears that are in the midst of where I am. But I'm saying, Lord, I need you to give me more of you so that you can empower me to stay different. Maybe for some of you, it's a prayer of repentance. For some of you, it's a prayer for God to breathe more of himself into you. But I want to make an appeal. If that's you today and you're saying, I know that God has not called me to be a tear, but I know that where I'm at, that if I continue in this direction, the influence of the tears may snuff out the wheat that is within me. If that's you, I want you to come to this altar. Because I believe that God is here to empower you to grow in the midst of evil. Oftentimes when I would hear the, 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 the word come out from among them and be separate, I would interpret that to mean that God is calling us to separate ourselves from the world. But I believe that he calls us out to pour more of himself in. Not so that we can stay in the church in comfort zones and enclaves where we feel safe at the expense of engagement with those in the world but he calls us to empower us, to recharge us so that we can go out into the world and be the salt of the earth, the light to the world. Ministry is not just a pulpit, y'all, but where God has you, the office that he has you in, the school that he has you at, the team that he has you as a part of, the places that he has called you to have influence in. 
That's ministry. And he has positioned us and empowered us to grow in the midst of evil. So if there's anyone else under the sound of my voice that you're saying, Lord, I need your strength to grow, to grow well, to stand firmly, to stay rooted, the altar is open. The altar is open. The altar is open. Because what the Lord needs more than ever now is not people who are going to recoil and go back because we see evil increasing. But people who are saying, I'm going to stand for the Lord until the day that I die. Lord, if you need me to go into the trenches, to go where others are afraid to go, Lord, I'll go. If you need me to proclaim your word, even if persecution will come, even if it means being laughed at, even if it means being misunderstood, even if it means being spat on, Lord, I'll go. And I'll say yes to your will. I'll say yes to your way. Come on, let's lift our hands. If you're at this altar, just lift your hands. And even those of you in your seats, just lift your hands and begin to cry out to the Lord. Lord, I acknowledge that I haven't always gotten it right. I acknowledge that I haven't always done things according to your will or to your way. I acknowledge that I have failed many a times, that I have broken your heart many a times. But Lord, I thank you that as there is breath in my body, there is still an opportunity for you to do a work in me, for you to empower me to grow in you and for you. You said in your word that you are the vine and we are the branches. Apart from you, we can do nothing. But in you and through you, God, you can empower us to be fruitful. So we surrender. Come on, just begin to surrender to the Lord. We surrender to you, Jesus. We surrender to you, Jesus. We surrender to you, Jesus. And Father, we pray in the name of the Lord that God you would heighten our discernment in this hour God that you would make us aware of the times that we are living in make us aware of the need to be rooted and grounded that God even if there be tears among us Father God we will not bat down but we will stand firmly rooted and grounded in you and grow fully in the name of Jesus let your will be done in us, Lord. Let your work be done in us, God. Apart from you, we can do nothing. But in you and through you, we can do what you're calling us to do. So God, I pray that as you see your people today, Father God, that those who do not know you as Lord, God, that you would save them like only you can. That those who are planted in your garden, God, that you would redeem them like only you can. Father, we pray that you would deliver. We pray that you would break the chains. We pray that you would destroy the yoke of the enemy in the name of Jesus. We declare, God, that the fire will not cause us to back up. The fire will not cause us to recoil. But God, we are being purified by you in the name of Jesus. Purify us, saturate us, redeem us. We don't want to be Christian in name only. We don't want to be Christian by affiliation only. But we want to bear good fruit that the world might come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We come against every hindrance every force of darkness opposing the word of God from being rooted and grounded in the hearts of the people of God and father we pray that you would loose your understanding God that you would loose your strength that you would loose your peace that you would loose God a fire that counters the fire of the enemy God a fire that ignites us with a deeper level of fervor with a deeper level of conviction with a deeper level of passion 
that in the name of Jesus, God, we will stand until you come. We will grow until you come. We will believe until you come. Help us to stay rooted, God. Help us to stay faithful, Lord. We thank you that even in the moments when we have failed to find the faith to stand firm, your faith remain. And God, we acknowledge our weakness, our frailty, our proclivity to embrace things that are at odds with your will. And we say, Lord, have your way. We surrender to you. We say yes to you. And God, as you empower us, we will grow. As you empower us, we will go. God, make us a living sacrifice. If it means crucifying some things in us and connected to us so that your glory might be revealed through us, let your will be done. That we might be a living sanctuary for you. In the name of Jesus, we say yes to you, God. We say yes to you, God. And we declare that your will will be done, that your name will be glorified, and that your kingdom will be established. We will not fear, we will not back down, but we go forward in the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.
I'm not talking about Shinene's hands. I'm talking about the mighty hands of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Because when you're in that hands, Kemi, no one can pluck you out of his hands. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that I'm in my father's hands. Regardless of what is going on around me. How many of you appreciate the ministry of Minister My Care this morning? Glory! Thank you. Thank you. We love him. We love him. He's the son of this house. We love him. We love him. Well, come on, show him some one more love. Because I, I know that message. I know that message didn't come here. That message didn't come easy. Yes, we are in the last days. Before we started this new series, Your Life Ever After, Minister Mike and I met, we, we, we talked, we see the trajectory of things, how the Lord would want us to shape this series, and we prayed. And the Lord gave him the word that he needed to give. The message you'll be hearing is not a judgmental message. We're not a judge. Christ, the soon returned king, is the judge. But we're called to declare the infallible, indestructible word that is able to give life. We're about giving life. But sometimes our aroma that comes out of us, Paul says sometimes it brings death. We don't bring it, but your witness, your testimony is what does the convicting through the Holy Spirit. And so the message is going to be good. Tell your neighbor it's going to be good. And it's going to be good to get us ready. To get us ready so we will not be those who fall asleep. We're living in perilous times. And perilous times are here. Do you appreciate the minister, Minister Paul Way And Brother Yemi this morning and I worshipped him. Hallelujah. Woo. It's so good to see, it's so good to see Farah, one of our new millennials, even joining us in Washington. Hallelujah. Beside that is Zemra too. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Lift up your hands as I give the benediction this morning. I want to commit you to the one who is able to keep you from falling. To the one who is able to keep you grounded and rooted in love and in your most holy faith. And now to him the ancient of this
immortal, invisible God who is able to keep you from falling. <laughs> and who is able to present you as a living sacrifice before His holy presence. To Him and for Him be all the glory this morning in our worship and in the Word. To Him be the honor in our testimony. And in our witness to him be the praise <laughs> in what he will do in you and in me this week as we usher in the kingdom of God and his righteousness to an unrighteous generation and him be the dominion power authority and majesty over this house over my house over your house over this city over this province over this nation and over this world to him be it all now until the end of the ages forever and ever and ever and all those who are wait for his appearing said amen and amen god bless you Wilma. god bless you we look forward to seeing you on wednesday we love you god bless you.